Um, let's get started tonight. There's a lot to say and a lot to cover, and so I want to get busy on what is our 97th lesson in our studies in John, and we're going to talk about abide in His love this evening. I want to read a verse that is not on the screen. I didn't give it to Obe for the screen. It's probably the most famous um, COVID verse <laughs> that's going around. Um, not, and no, not Second Chronicles 7.14. That would be the most famous negative COVID verse that uh, people are convinced that God's trying to teach us something. Um, no, Psalms 91.1 is the verse that has been probably quoted and used as much or more than any. And I thought of this verse too late to add it, but I thought that it would be a good starting point tonight. Psalm 91.1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And the reason I wanted to read that was not only because it's pretty popular right now and it's a verse that gets sort of thrown about in regards to protection during this season, but it has our word in it. It has that word abide, the word that Jesus uses a lot in John, but John the writer uses a lot in, in his gospel and in his letters, and that is how we are to abide in the love of God. And I was just struck by the fact that we've used Psalm 91.1 as a way of encouraging ourselves forever that we are in his protection, we are in his shelter, and we should because we are in those things. We've used that word abide. But we have something, and I don't want to make it sound as if Psalms 91.1 is not powerful or not effective, but we have something better. We have something better than the idea of an Old Testament song that talks about dwelling in God's shadow. We have Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those promises. So while Psalm 91.1 is a great psalm, and it's a great prayer of protection, and we ought to be believing that we're going to abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and that's where we're going to live. We have a better hope and a better promise because we have seen all of it in the man, Christ Jesus. And so I'm one who I do study and read the entire Bible, but I love to try to bring everything I can back to our Lord Jesus because that's what makes us who we are. Um, we're not apostles of good scripture. We're not disciples of the book of Psalms or Proverbs. We're disciples of a man named Jesus. And so to every chance we get to bring that back to him, that's what we're going to do tonight as we subtitle this Abide in His Love. I want to start where we stopped last week. We're going to try to do that again this week and just lead right up to where we want to go into next week. These are really, these are laying themselves out for me in John 15 because there are so many popular moments that need dealt with that it's easy during study to just go, okay, Spend as much time as you want on these four or five verses. Stop because you know you, this needs an hour. And so then you do that next week. And um, we probably spent a little more time on the vineyard stuff than, than uh, I was going to say than we should have. That's subjective. Um, then we, we, we was, it wasn't really necessary, but I think we, we dug into some stuff that's probably been some of the most responded to spots in this entire study from people. We've heard, I've heard more feedback over the, the vineyard stuff over the last several weeks of anything we've done this entire book. It's like we're picking up new people just because of the vineyard information. It's like they're spreading it going, hey, listen to this, haven't heard this before or whatever. Um, and so I'm glad we slowed down, took our time, really broke those metaphors, those illustrations and those pictures down. And it's not really finished as you're going to see tonight because we're still in that chapter. And so the greater context is going to come back as we study even into this evening, that greater context of vineyards and what that means. And so it's part of this abiding because remember when we talk about abiding, we're talking about being grafted in. We still have the vineyard image, even though we're not really talking about the vineyard, that we've been placed into the wound. Think of that V cut that's in that, that, uh, that root and they cut that out and then put that bud inside and tape it up. And then the qualities of that root begin to become the qualities of that vine abides the key word because if you walked into the vineyard and pulled those branches off the vine and thought, well, we'll just plant them over here. Well, you're going to destroy some things because it's already begun to take on the nutrients of the root. You can't just start over and say, well, we're going to try it over here. It's too late. You've already, it's already begun to pick up its qualities. You have already begun to pick up the qualities of Christ. It's too late for you. You came to Jesus and you met Christ. It's too late for you. You can't go back. 
You can try to go back, but you'll never be the same again. And I think that needs said to Christians. I came up in a church culture that always threatened me. I'm not throwing stones. It's just the, it was just the undercurrent, okay? It's just what was in every song and sermon is, is you might lose this. You better hold on. Better, better keep yourself. And there is some keep yourself. We're going to look at keep yourself tonight. Keep yourself's important, but it's not keep yourself saved. Um, so that, that's his role. He saves me. Once I'm taped onto him, I can't help it. The second you get taped onto him, the second you get grafted onto him, you start taking on his qualities. I wish someone had told me, and this is what I'm trying to tell you and trying to tell the world, is it's inescapable. The moment that you get grafted in, it's inescapable. You begin to take on his qualities. You can't help it. You can't help it. You can't help but take on the qualities of his fruit. They start to come out in your life. Now you can run and you can get mad at God and you can rebel and you can say, I'm finished with this stuff. And God's not going to hold his thumb on you. You can go do whatever you want to do. But you're never, you're never going to be able to shake the fact that you were grafted in and you had an encounter and something happened to you that changed the way you look at the world, that changed the way you look at your neighbor, changed the way you look at yourself. You're never going to get around that. And, and so I'm not going to argue the, 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 theologic, the finer points of the theology of backsliding of you're saved and then you're not saved. I don't believe that's possible, but I'm not going to get into a, a fighting and a shouting match with people that want to throw scriptures back and forth. All I'll say is, I'm already clean by the words he's spoken to me. I'm just quoting Jesus now. I'm already clean by the words he's spoken to me. He's grafted me into the vine. And if you know anything about a vine and a branch, once it's grafted in, it's never going to have a better, it's never going to have a different use. And so saved, backslid, saved, then lost. What I know is grafted in, never the same again. Now what you do with that, that's between you and the Lord. But grafted in, never the same again. And so the abiding part, there is a part of it that is ours. And I want to start where we ended by reading 15.8 from John. And then we'll put the screen up. I forgot one last week. I had I crammed so much stuff in and I skipped one. And I thought that was where we'll start tonight. So here's the verse that supports it. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So that's how God gets glory. That's how the Father gets glory is when fruit comes out of us because that's what anyone that owns a vineyard is waiting for is the day they get the grapes and the day they, they begin to make their own wine. That's the glory of the winery. So you and bearing fruit is the glory of the Father. And so that's when you're going to be his disciples. His disciples bear fruit, by the way. Now, Jesus never sinned. Jesus was a miracle worker. But Jesus doesn't say, you're going to be my disciples when you work miracles. You're going to be my disciples when you stop sinning. He says, you're going to, you're going to be my disciples when you bear fruit. Now, he's going to go on in the next passage, this is where we're going tonight, to really describe what that looks like. And the stunning thing is that you don't begin to reflect discipleship when you stop failing, even though Jesus never failed. You begin to reflect discipleship when you produce fruit just like the, 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 branch, the root. He's the vine, you're the branch. So when the branch starts to bring out the qualities in the grape that were in the root, then you know you are the disciple. You know that you're bringing glory to the Father. Here's what that fruit looks like. Jesus' is fruit, and this is where we, what we missed last week that kind of would have helped cap us off. Jesus' fruit was sometimes shown by receiving and accepting people. Thus, our fruit is sometimes in receiving and accepting both people and the goodness of our Father. Let me deal with that one first. Jesus' is fruit, what He produced on the earth. Don't just think walk on water, feed the hungry. That's part of it. Those are, those are maybe the details of those extensions. But consider that Jesus sometimes was a receiver and an acceptor. People were brought to Him. He should reject. By law, He received them. He accepted them. And that tells me that part of the fruit of who I am is to receive and accept people. Receive them where they are, accept them for who they are, and when I do that, I look like Jesus. Right? If I reject people and I deny people, I don't look like Jesus. Jesus was not in the reject and deny business. He said, come unto me. 
everyone gets to come unto me. So there was no, you don't qualify. So if you're in a church and people go, do you allow this kind of person in your church? The answer should always be yes. There's never a person that you go, no, we don't really accept that. Because you're a, you, a fruit, you are a disciple of a fruit producer. And part of his fruit was receive and accept. And so we receive and accept people, but we also receive and accept the favor of our Father. And you got to be receivers. The new covenant is about reception. For as many of you as receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. What do you have to do? Receive. Easy. Receive, right? Easy to say, hard to do. Because yeah. you say it, we all shout, woo, I'm going to receive. And then we go right out and, and start to pile up works before God and go, well, what should I do? And, oh, boy, I didn't get what I thought I should get. Got to go back to the Lord, figure out what I did wrong. People say that all the time, even in grace circles. Got to go back to the Lord, figure out what I did wrong. In other words, God held something back from me because I didn't do the right thing. I thought you were supposed to be receiving abundance of grace yeah. and the gift of righteousness. So part of our fruit is to receive. But then there's another side. There's always another side. Sometimes his fruit was to give and his fruit was to serve. So it, was, it wasn't always about taking in with Jesus. It was often about giving out, often about giving out. I, I, it would be worthwhile to look at the Gospels and look at all of the moments in Jesus. You'd probably come up with 50-50, I'm guessing, but of, of Jesus receiving in and Jesus giving out. Every time he opens his mouth, he's giving out. But a lot of times while he's giving out, he's receiving. Woman, where are your accusers? Therefore, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. He did both right there in one, in one paragraph. I receive you. I accept you. I also give to you the gift of no condemnation. And I give, I empower you to go be what you need to be. And so part of our fruit is the receiving and part of our fruit is giving. This is why to be his disciples, we can't be silent. Not forever. It's going to be a time we have to open our mouths. We have to proclaim. We have to speak into people's lives. We have to be real and relevant because it's part of who we are. So continuing on in John 15, 9, this is the next verse and. This is where, I don't believe we got here last week. If we did, we just put it up, but we didn't really work on it. So this is kind of springboards us into the abiding lesson tonight. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. A, a complaint that some people give, I've heard this more than once, about preaching love, teaching love, is that there isn't a verse where Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I love you. And there isn't. There's not a moment in the Gospels or whatever where Jesus in the first person says in an active word, I love you. Though that's sort of the, the marker for us of love is saying to someone you love them. Um, however, to act as if Jesus doesn't actively show love is to deny the life of Jesus and the statements of Jesus. Jesus speaks to them as I've been loved by my Father. That's how I've loved all of you. And so while it sounds past tense, it's for Jesus it's more active than just verbal. It's kind of like, would you rather someone say to you, I love you, or would you rather someone show you they love you? So we live in sort of a romantic, we have this sort of romantic idea of we'd like for Jesus to say, I love you. Um, but Jesus is the, the writers. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to say Jesus never said to people, I love you. Um, I think it's quite possible he did. But the style of writing in the Greek world of that day um, it would have been odd to write the words, I love you. And for a lot of literature, it would have been odd to write the words, I love you. It didn't mean anything. What meant something was to write a, and show how loved someone was because words can be empty. So Jesus' entire life is showing off the love of the Father and who the Father is and what the Father, how the Father loves in people's lives. Um, even up into modern society, um, expressing love is not as important in many cultures as showing love. There's entire generations of people that never, you know, they didn't say I love you. And that was odd. My dad tells me his dad never once in his life said out loud the words I love you to him. And my dad worked very hard so that I would never say that. So my dad said I love you a lot. Um, 
but he showed me that he loved me. He would never have had to have said it, I don't think, and I would have known. My point in that was there was a whole generation there that was like, you didn't say it, you didn't, you weren't physically affectionate, but you took care, you paid your bills, you took care of your family, and you, you did what you had to do. So that's the expression of love. And so we see that expression of love in the life of Jesus and the response in, in who Jesus is. It is, and man, this is something that I want you to just grab tonight. This is really what abiding as love is all about. It is your responsibility to abide in his love because the system of this world will not reinforce his love for you. All right? The system of this world does not deal in the supernatural or the spiritual. It looks at you a little crazy if you talk a lot about being loved by God or being loved by the Father. So don't look to the system of the world for approval when it comes to the love of God. It's never going to happen. They're going to tell you to love yourself before they tell you to receive the love of God. Love yourself's a big thing in the world. You got to love yourself. The reality is, is if you don't believe that you're loved by something bigger than you, Loving yourself is probably not going to go very far either. And so there's a baseline for loving yourself that starts with, I believe I'm worth loving. How am I worth loving? God loves me. I'm, I, he's, he's designed this for me. And if he designed this for me, he must care about me. If he cares for me, it's okay for me to care for me. A lot of people don't love themselves because there's nothing to love. They don't feel any reason to love, no impetus to love. Why would I? Nobody else cares for me, so why should I care for me? So when we grasp the love of God, we have the responsibility to hold ourselves in that, then, we be, then we're able to love ourselves. That's why I think the love yourself message is it's real secular humanist. Um, but Because it's, it's not based in anything. It's just you deciding. To, and there's a power in self-decision making. But it only goes so far if you have nothing behind it to give it its power. And the moment your boat rocks and you become doubtful, then that self-love goes right out the window with it because there's nothing to hold on to other than your own mental ability and your own strength. And so we're not leaning. I think that's what the Bible meant when it said don't lean to your own understanding. That's not just don't, don't trust that you know the answer. Sometimes you need to go figure out some answers. Don't lean under your own understandings. Don't base your opinion of yourself simply on yourself, but on something greater than yourself. So I know that I'm loved. That's what the cross is so important for, because it expresses the love of the Father. So the world's not going to help you, all right? And if you judge your worthiness based upon the world system, then you're going to fall short. So if you base yourself, it's not just that I love myself, but if you then base your ability to love or respect yourself on the system of the world, you're going to find a reason to not love yourself. Because yeah. this is what happens. As you begin to base your self-worth on how the world views you, you'll begin to do it through the lens of the world. And how the world does it is through body type, intelligence, amount of money you make, where you live, who your family is. The, the, just add something there. Because every culture has their little categories and their little things as to how we judge ourselves. And you might do okay for a while. This is the trick of the world, of, of the, of the self-judgment of the world. You might do okay because you might actually fall into one of the categories where you're worth something. But then you'll get around a different lens and you won't be worth much because they don't view that the same way. Or you get a little older and you lose your looks or you lose your job or your car stops running or you got to change neighborhoods. All the stuff you built it on, Jesus called that, by the way, building it on sand. Why sand? Because waves hit it. And then you got to start all over again. So like junk hits, and then you go, oh man, so I thought I, thought I had something going there. And then I, that happened, and no, oh, that's gone. Now what am I going to do? The rock is something more stable that takes the blows of this world. This is why you must abide in his love. The responsibility is yours to do it. Jude said it this way. I, I love the Bible, how, how if we watch for it, the scripture has such complimentary moments. So Jude here, helping John, powerful couple of verses. But you, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Look at that. It's, this, it's the same general principle given to you in John 15. Keep yourself in God's love. Now, I love this next line because it says what we were saying in that previous paragraph. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 
You see, the system of the world is a no mercy system. And so what Jude says is you're going to have to keep yourself in the love of God by turning to the mercy of the Lord. Because if you turn to the mercy of the world, you'll never keep yourself in the love of God. You'll judge yourself. You'll hate yourself. You'll cut yourself. You'll short yourself. You'll doubt yourself. You will always be stacked up against better people, smarter people, richer people, prettier people. Just the list will go on and on and you'll struggle to keep yourself sane. Because you're always comparing what the Bible calls comparing yourself against yourself. What that really means is comparing yourself against other humans. It's like, what, why, would, why would you do this? You're never... It's like I always, when, I was, when we were coming up playing baseball, Lucas, it was one of the things that we always talked about. He was, he's been, from the day he stepped onto a field, hyper-competitive. So if he plays, he wants to win. You know, that's, that's why are we out here? That's what he would tell you. So what's the point of this game? Oh, so we're not keeping score? He would rather go do something else. So you're not going to keep score. We're not going to mess around because we're supposed to win and you're supposed to crush people. <laughs> you know, that's his whole philosophy. And so I'll go in a, and I, I tried to keep that in, in, in a good place with him. You know, learn how to harness that. Um, let's be a good loser and a good winner and, and whatever. But I remember as, as, we were, as I was teaching the game and I always try to teach principle, not just stuff because he, he had talent. So he always wanted to teach principles and how to use that talent properly. And one of the things I always put in him that I now is in college, he's off on the other side of the country playing ball, and I still see this come back. I see this surface because of those early days of teaching. Is to say, don't forget, there's always somebody better than you. All right? So there's always a kid that'll outhit you, a kid that'll outrun you, a kid that'll outthrow you. And if you will respect that knowledge, you'll be a better player because you'll respect your opponent. You won't judge him on how he looks. Um, you won't step into the box and see a kid on the mound. You watched him warm up and think, yeah, I got him. I said, because you're three pitches from getting embarrassed. And you know that, because that's the way this works. And so there's always somebody. Now, I ha we kind of had to do that in the sports world because that was a way to sort of harness that self-judging. I did in that world what you don't want to do in your day-to-day -day life. I had him judge himself against others. So you always kind of keep yourself humble in that area because you go, well, I don't know. I, you, you don't know if you're better than that guy. You gotta really gotta watch it. You're gonna have to play up. It's the system of the world. Yeah. It's plain and simple. It's the system of the world. So I always taught him when you step across that white line, you've gotta play that system if you're gonna play that game. Now, there's a system of living on this earth that's not a game. So we're not, we're not trying to outscore people, all right? That's what I meant by we've got to control that competitiveness. Because if you don't control that competitiveness, then you start to judge yourself that way every day. You start, to re, you start to judge yourself in business that way. You start to judge yourself in relationships that way. You're just miserable. And you, you're, not going to have, you're not going to be walking in the mercy because you don't have mercy on others. So step outside the chalk. Get off the field of competition and live this game of life in which it's not about scoring the most points because you don't belong to the system of the world. You belong to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God's unconventional. It's where, we, we, it's where we play the game for the benefit of our teammate, not for the benefit of the scoreboard. It's not to try to get ahead. So if you go out into the world and you play the world's game, you're going to struggle to keep yourself in the love of God. And so that's why Jude gives you the warning that Jude gives you. Now go back to John 15. Here's the next couple of verses in this run. If you keep, this is 10 and 11. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Now, we don't let, don't let the commandment line freak you out yet. We've dealt with this before. We'll deal with it a little bit again tonight. Just keep that in mind. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. As I said, we'll deal with what that commandment is because that's going to lead us right up to where we need to be tonight. But I want to deal with that line about joy for a second because Jesus is talking about the fact that He has something that's going to remain in you. Notice that. So it's already in there. It's going to remain in you. Even after I'm gone, it's going to remain in you so that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full is a line used again in 1 John. I didn't put this scripture up, but 1 John 1, 3, when John does his intro, 
of his little book, 1 John. We, we tasted him, we saw him, we handled the word of life. And then he says, we write these things so that your joy may be full. It's the same phrase. So he uses this phrase he heard Jesus use. I always thought that was kind of cool. He uses a phrase he heard Jesus use in John 15, and he drops it in 1 John 1, 3 as if it's his own. And so, so I write this to you so that your joy may be full. Jesus told us about joy. Let's look at joy for a second. Joy is the Greek word kara. Uh, very close um, to charis. It's got that same root, um, that, that same sort of prefix in the Greek as charis, which of course is favor and grace. There's an element of joy and gladness and grace and favor. Yeah, no one's ever had grace and favor that wasn't glad about it. You know, so that's why that's there, because there's an underlying element of joy. The Greek for kara is actually joy, delight, and gladness. But I want you to note that it's more than an emotion. It's a state. Okay? Because what happens sometimes is that we confuse happiness with joy. We think that if believers aren't happy, they must not be walking in the favor of God. It is a rough life to live to try to walk happy all the time. Um, newsflash. It isn't going to happen. You are not always going to be happy, all right? Now, you can always walk in the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is literally your strength. Now, how do you compare? How, this is just me, all right? What I put up here on the, on the screen tonight is how I would compare it, all right? And as to say, what's the difference in happy and joy, all right? Think of it this way. The phrase, my kids are my pride and joy. You hear people say stuff like that, all right? Not a bad statement. I would agree. My kids are my pride and joy. That has nothing to do with emotion. That's a permanent state. They're always my pride and joy. They may not make me happy, but they're my joy. Did you get the difference there? Okay, so they're my pride and joy. They may, not, they may do stupid things, and I'm not happy about it. And I, get, I can get upset and wish they had done differently. But they don't cease to be my joy. You're, you're, my, you're, you're the joy of my life, you say. And that is a solid state. That doesn't change with their attitude even. That doesn't change with their goodness or their badness. It doesn't change with how they navigate the world. Now, I use that illustration because when you look at the Greek for joy, we're not talking about an emotion. We're talking about a solid state. Jesus doesn't promise you constant happiness. Jesus promises you the joy of the Lord, His joy, the kind of joy that is satisfied in who you are and what you have. You see, I think what we mean when we say my kids are my pride and my joy is my kids give me that happy, they give me that, that stasis. I don't want to trade them in. They're mine. I'm at a satisfied state. And for whatever your joy is, now you want your joy to be something worth building on, right? Because uh, you want your joy to be firm. You don't want it to be shifting sand. So you want it to be something that you've invested your heart in. So when Jesus gives his joy, gives it to his disciples, he's giving something he's invested in. Look at the next verse, John 15, 12. This is my commandment. Remember a moment ago when we said, we'll deal with what does Jesus mean when he says, if you keep my commandments, you abide in me, I abide in you. What commandments are, th are those? We've dealt with this before, but it's certainly worth saying because here it is. This is my commandment, and here it is, that you love one another as I have loved you. We did a whole week on this when we first encountered this thought back in John 13, um, where Jesus said, hey, here's a new commandment. Remember this? A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I've loved you. And we did a whole week on a new commandment um, because the old commandments are about what you do. The new commandment is about how you love. That's a whole different ball game. And the old way is love your neighbor as yourself. And the new way is love your neighbor to the extent you know you're loved. And that's better because it starts with knowing you're loved. And so new covenant love is know your love first. If you don't know you're loved, you're not going to do very well at loving others. It's kind of like what I said earlier. If you start with self-love, but you don't receive his love, you're going to fall apart. Because all you got is self-love. You don't have it built on anything. It's built on you. Good luck. Because you're going to disappoint yourself. 
You know, that's why self-love doesn't work because you're going to make yourself mad and sad and depressed and angry and you're going to disappoint yourself and you're going to hate yourself. And then, and that's, this ends, it's funny, but it ends really bad for some people because self-love turns into self-loathing and then self-loathing turns into hatred and hatred. That, that's a, that's a hell and a chaos and, 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 and death is soon to follow a lot of times. And even at your own hand, um, a loss of, of self because there's not that stability of knowing that we are loved. So the ability, if the ability to love myself is that I know I'm loved, then the ability to love other people is going to be predicated off of knowing that I'm loved too. I can't really love you if I don't know he loves me. Because if I don't know he loves me, then I'm going to judge you. I can't help it. Because I'm going to judge me against you. And I don't want you to be as good as me. So I'm going to down you. And I'm going to judge you. And I'm going to do everything I can to keep you in your place. And this is why people hurt you. Because they're doing their best to keep you in your place because they haven't received the love of the Father and they're judging based upon how they feel about themselves. So they attack you verbally, they attack you physically, they attack you emotionally, mentally, whatever, because there's an insecurity in their own heart about who they are. We say this to our kids, but we don't even, but we don't put it in our own lives. Like we'll say to our kid, you know that kid's only making fun of you or he's only being a bully because he, he, he doesn't know who he is or whatever. And we don't put that, we ought to put that in our own lives. Go, you know what, you know why this instance is going on in my life? Because I'm dealing with someone who has no idea who they are. Yeah. They have no idea that they're loved. Here I am getting mad at them as if I don't know that I'm loved. Mm -hmm. I've just left myself right back into the system of the world, forgot who my dad is, and just went after them. And, and I, I gave up my greatest asset. My greatest asset's my identity. I know that I'm loved. I know that I'm called. I know I'm his son. Why would I lay that aside so I can go back fight on the turf of the world? If we start to put that over, not just into our own lives, but into our corporate lives, into our worship lives, into our national life, then the golden rule becomes the rule. It becomes that I take care of my neighbor. I have to because it's part of what I am. So I love because I know that I'm loved. Um, what's, what did I give you next? Oh. Yeah, we abide in him and we do what he commands. This is a long one, but I just kind of work my way through this slow. These are some thoughts I had to try and help us understand where this has brought us from and where this is taking us to. We abide in him and we do what he commands. What does he command is that we love as we're loved. That's simple. Don't, you don't have to clout, muddy the waters. Start worrying about which laws are still applicable. We get into big fights about is the dietary law applicable in the old covenant? Is the sanitary law? You missed the point. Jesus was talking about this, whatever he commanded you. What did he command you? Love. So just stop there. If you just did that, you wouldn't have to worry about freaking out about all the other stuff. If you'd be so busy loving unlovable people, it'd take up your whole life rather than trying to figure out what makes you holy when you're really holy in him. Just love. And so Jesus' command is love the way you're loved. The greater context, don't forget this, it still includes the vine illustration. We're still in John 15. We haven't really left it. We haven't really left the I'm the true vine and you're the branches. My father's a good husbandman. So keeping that illustration in mind, we're grafted in, we're pruned. Remember that's placed and positioned. It's put where we need to be put. It's good fruit getting clipped. Works. They're not bad, but they're not the one. It's not where we belong. So stuff gets cut and trimmed and the Father's tying us to the, vine, to the wire. We're grafted and we're pruned, but it's not just for our own development. Don't forget this. This is a hard one to really grasp. You're really cut and pruned for the benefit of your neighbor. An inescapable truth of New Testament theology. Please hear this. We want to talk about inescapable New Testament truths. We talk about the Holy Ghost. We talk about gifts. We talk about heaven. We talk about demons. We talk about hell. You want to know what an inescapable truth of New Covenant theology is? Pruning and training ultimately concerns our neighbor. That is an ultimate inescapable truth of New Testament theology. What God does in you ultimately is not only about you. It is about the world around you because the Father doesn't care for you more than He cares for your worst enemy. And man, that is a hard one for me to get. That is a hard one for me to accept. I don't want Him to like my worst enemy as much as He likes me. You know, I'm just being honest with you. I don't want Him to like the people that don't like me. Like if you don't like me, I don't want God to really like you. 
I mean, he can, he can love you in a spiritual way, but I want him to be as unhappy with you as I am. I want him and the Father to sit around in heaven and go, you know, I'm with Paul on this one. Um, I don't like the way they're treating him, and we're going to go down there and stop it. I, I really want to feel that that's what he does. I don't think it's what happens, though. I think it's the exact opposite of that that the Father loves them as much as He loves me, and whatever He's doing in me, He's doing so that ultimately He and I are in one another, that I'm in the root. That's first. That's where I am. I'm in Him, and so I start to take on His qualities. I start to, I start to feed on what He feeds on, you know? Like what He is, I am. And that's what I become. An, I'm, I'm individualizing this for a moment. So that... Whatever pruning happens, whatever trimming and clipping and stuff that's going on in Paul White is not just for me, but it's to position me properly because you and I coexist in the world and you have things to offer me and I have things to offer you. And if my world becomes all about me getting to just go to heaven someday, then it becomes harder for my world to involve you. Because I don't really have room for you. You start to become a nuisance to my spiritual relationship. This is what happened to the Pharisees. Loving people became a hindrance to doing the work of God. And if loving people becomes a hindrance to your holiness and a hindrance to your sanctification, and a hindrance to your Christianity, you need to go back to the root and look at what He commands because that's what it means to abide in Him, is to, go, to be right where He commands. It's to love as He loves. Let me show you how the author of Hebrews handles this. Look at Hebrews 12. I want to read 11, 12, and 13. This is the great discipline chapter of Hebrews 12. it has been a lot of fear come out of this chapter for people over the years. And I'm going to tell you why as we go. Now, no chastening, or literally the word discipline, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but it's painful. Nevertheless, and, and, and by the way, the word painful is actually, I'm doing a message on this this week, um, that has to do with sorrow. I'm doing a message tomorrow called Why Condemnation and Feeling Bad Are Not the Same Thing that I'm going to post this weekend. And one of the things I want to bring out is that sorrow can be godly. Paul said it was. There's a such thing as godly sorrow that leads men to fix their lives, stop doing what they're doing. And the word used for painful right here is the same word Paul uses for the word sorry. So now, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but it makes me sorry. I'm sorry that I'm going through it. This is what the author of Hebrews says. I don't like it. I don't like whatever discipline I'm going through. Nevertheless, after the discipline is over, look at what it does. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. This is a vineyard term. So think again about our vine dresser. Snip, 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 moving vines, tying them up against the wire, moving them out. Ugh, I don't like this. You just cut off some fruit. It's not good. Don't cut off fruit. Putting the vines on the vineyard floor. I don't like any of this. This isn't what I was got into this thing for. But it yields peaceable fruit. It yields the fruit that a master vine dresser knows you need. And so this is why I say, don't be scared of Hebrews 12. We talk about the chastening of the Lord. We go, Oh, God's going to discipline some people. It's because we're only thinking in punitive terms. The vine dresser walks through the vineyard. He's not cutting off fruit because he's mad. He doesn't go through and go, Oh, I'm going to show you, vine, snap and just burning stuff. And just... No, he walks through as a master whose hands know what they're doing. And when he snips, it's with purpose. And it's not anger. It's love and passion. The, the kind of passion that makes for a great vintage. Now, if you let some moron run around out in the vineyard and just clip like crazy to show those vines, then you're going to have a disaster on your hands because they're going to cut stuff off that doesn't need cut off. And this is what happens sometimes we get in abusive spiritual relationships that people that just like to use swords. Yeah. 
They just like to come through and just chop because you see, I told you so. I told you you had stuff that could be cut away and they're cutting away. Man, they're cutting away passion and hope and love and dreams and excitement and, and, and calling it all wicked. And that's, that's calling evil good and good evil. Yeah. That's a disaster. And that happens all the time in the name of Jesus, by the way. But true discipline from a master vine dresser it's never, we're not happy about it, but we know it, man, it's going to yield a peaceful fruit of righteousness. It's going to be stuff that comes out of this. I'm not even going to know it for a year or five years or 10 years. And man, it's going to be good stuff because he knows what he's doing. Now look at the next word, the top of 12, therefore, which means find out what it's there for. So if you know you're being disciplined, let me, let me throw this line in. Stop viewing discipline as punitive start viewing discipline as preparatory so it's not being punished it's being prepared you know i always use my coach illustration if a coach watches the team do something stupid on the field and they give up a touchdown then when he comes to practice they're going to get disciplined but it's not going to be because they failed not if he's a good coach because it doesn't do you any good to punish people after they failed on the football field he's only disciplining you so that you don't do it next week. The discipline is, hey, we could fix this and not give up that touchdown because here's where we messed up. Now, if it's the last game of the season, how dumb is it to bring the team in after the season's over and punish them for the play they made on the last game? No one's, no, there's no passion in that because you're not preparing me for anything. You're just mad that I made you look bad. But if you want me to do better, then you need to, there, there needs to be a trimming of the stuff that doesn't work so that what works can be the peaceable fruit of righteousness. But now that you know it's happening for a reason, look at what the reason is. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. You have people around you who are, whose hands hang low. That word feeble is the word paralyzed. You have people around you who are paralyzed. And they need help. And you can't help them. You're powerless to help them until you have been disciplined. Not beat up for what you've done wrong, but disciplined so that you're of use. This is important. So let me bring that thought home with this. Israel's mentality was that she was the vine. When we did our lesson on the true vine, I tried to show you that Jesus combated the, the Israel as the vine and said, no, I am now, right? But Israel's mentality is that she was the vine and all things rotated around her and her place in the world. So much so that she called heaven and earth Jerusalem. Yeah. Everything rotates around us. Why not? We're God's chosen people, right? All things rotate around her and her place in the world. As a unit, she felt she was alone among the nations of the world, but that was not God's end game. It was not God's end game for her to be alone among the nations of the world. Here was how she thought of herself. 1 Kings 4.25. This is during the reign of Solomon. Solomon's at the top of his game right here. A, a trillion dollar temple in today's dollars he builds in Jerusalem. Conquered the world of his day. Judah and Israel dwelt safely. Each man under his vine and his fig tree. From Dan as far as Beersheba. All the days of Solomon. Look at Israel. Everybody's under his own vine. Take care of me. Zechariah comes along, the end of the canon of the Old Testament, and says this in Zechariah 3, 8, 9, and 10. Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they're a wondrous sign. Behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. Who is this? Okay. I'm bringing forth my servant, Jesus. Next, next verse. For behold, the stone that I've laid before Joshua, on that stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. This is what's going to happen at Calvary. Takes care of the iniquity in one moment. Why? Because I sent you my branch. Now watch what happens when that branch gets here. In that day, what day? In the day I remove the iniquity of the world. That's the Jesus day. In that day, says the Lord, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Because when Jesus comes to take care of the issue of the world, not in your future, 
That's, it's happened. When Jesus came to take care of the issue of the world, it stopped being about one people on the earth named Israel, and it started being about everybody gets to come in sit underneath this vine. The end game of God was never one person, was never one group. It was the whole wide world. He's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. It's the whole world that's in his focus. So here's where we end tonight. John 15, 13. What a verse. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. I think ultimately the biggest part of the work I want to do here, I want to do next week. So I'll try to wrap it up with, with just the thought that this is one of the most famous verses to describe the sacrifice of Jesus. My fear is is that this verse has been co-opted by everyone who's ever made any sort of sacrifice. And it doesn't belong to us. This is a Jesus verse. This is not the American soldier. This is not you at your job. This is not you raising your kids. This is not you at school, right? This is not you standing up for your, for your buddy. This is Jesus, all right? And, and so I just I keep that thought in mind because I've seen this verse literally taken and we've put others on par with the sacrifice of Jesus. Nothing in the world is on par with the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. Nothing. If it is, then Jesus is not the ultimate sacrifice. There's no, there's, it's not even a good metaphor. I don't even like it as an allegory. Well, I'm not saying they're like Jesus, but I'm saying it's the ultimate sacrifice. No, it belongs to no one but Jesus. He lays down his life. It's not taken from him. It's not forced from him. He lays it down. And so that'll be a good place to start next week as we're going to talk about he calls us friends next week. And we're going to show you how he takes Israel from being a servant to being a friend. And then ultimately, he takes us on into sonship because that is God's end game is to graft us in as family. All right, let's pray over this word. Father, Thank you that we get to abide. Thank you that you have grafted us into the vine and we are taking on the nutrients and the qualities of the vine. We are beginning to be disciples in a world in which we love our neighbor and we show forth the glory of God through how we treat our neighbor. Thank you, Father, for what you are doing and who you are. Thank you for the glory and the joy that we had and we saw tonight as we shared this good news about you. And may we begin to rest in this knowledge in Jesus' name. Amen.